but thank you all for coming. We're going to talk today about an extraordinary person who recently had a <coughs> massive biography. So that's the name of the biographer, Anya Jabour from the University of Montana. And she got access to Breckenridge's letters and family documents. So it's new material, and it's a really great biography. And of course, there's a lot of other material here in the law school. She was a, an amazing, influential person in the early 20th century. And so the fact that we don't know much about her is a pity, and I'm so glad that this wonderful book exists. So um, she, Sophonis Nisba Breckenridge, those are her dates, was barely five feet tall when she was in law school. She had, the janitors had to lower the desks. I don't know what these desks were, but somehow they had to lower the desks so her feet could touch the floor. But this was a large mind and heart and an important career of social science scholarship and social activism. She was the first woman to receive a PhD from our university in, in social science. There's, I'm not clear whether there were other fields in which women were first. And then she was the first to get a law degree after the PhD from our law school. Uh, she was a pioneer in quantitative social science research and connected that with activism in a number of areas. So in this talk, I want to, because I think the interesting question is how did she get there? And what role did the University of Chicago play in making it possible for her to do all the important things she later did? So I'm not going to do more than touch on the later career and all her achievements, but talk about the early life. So I want to start with her father. Her, she was born in Kentucky. Her father, W.C.B. Breckenridge, was a practicing lawyer and also a member of Congress. He served in the Confederate Army and the whole family were proud Confederate patriots, which later caused her great uh, angst and she later had to separate herself from the racist beliefs on which she'd been brought up and she became one of the founders of the NAACP. But that was a struggle for her because she loved this Confederate father. Her father, and she records her very deep love for him. She said, I cannot speak of myself without speaking of him. He taught her to read by pointing to words in his law books. He said, you were my baby from the hour of your birth. I put you to sleep. I walked you when you were sick. And then he wrote, books were her playthings before she knew her letters. And as she grew, they became her companions, then her friends. But notice that it was words in law books. I, I have to say this strikes a note with me because my father gave me his cast off briefcases and I would play law office with my dolls and I would bring these briefcases in. So, so this is a very similar childhood. Her relationship to her mother was, and this is also very significant, was more distant because the mother had had so many pregnancies that she was exhausted and in very poor health. And Sophonisba observed that and went on observing similar things as she grew older. So she was obviously a, a prodigy and read a lot, but she started university at Kentucky A&M at the age of 14. However, she encountered a lot of sexist instructors. There's one occasion where a sexist math professor wanted to humiliate her in front of the trustees when they came to the class. So, so the day before, he had given her a question. She couldn't figure out the answer, so he thought, okay, I'll set her up and humiliate her in front of the trustees. But overnight, she had worked on this problem and she had figured out the answer. So she covered herself with glory in front of the trustees. But she did not want to stay at Kentucky A&M. So she went to Wellesley College, which already was a beacon for women. And she went in 1884, she got her BA in 1888 and had a liberal arts education of the kind that we still have here at the University of Chicago, and also a practical education, learning about women's careers and the different lives that women could have. Later on, she would say that the liberal arts were a waste of time because they weren't practical enough, and I, I don't like this, but she did say that. <laughs> the truth was, actually, that she got a great deal out of it. She developed skills of many, many kinds. She knew a lot of history, political economy, skills in critical thinking and debate. She was a very good writer. 
She acquired a knowledge of world history and politics, US history and politics. She knew how to read Latin for pleasure. She loved experimental science. But above all, she actually loved math, where she did advanced courses, and that was her, her major subject. And that will serve her well later in her work in quantitative social science. She was socially quite popular, but she was still a bookworm, and you'll see different pictures of her going by. When she was put in charge of Tree Day, which is a custom at Wellesley that they still have, when I was there it was still a, still a custom, she decided that all the young women should be dressed up in mathematical costumes, representing cones, cubes, and so forth. So that was her mind. It was very oriented toward math. But she also found there a community of women who supported one another and supported aspirations for women's careers in both the faculty and the student body. The faculty, of course, was full of women. It had some men, but the place where women could go if they were really good scholars, that, that was the place. And there was much discussion of marriage pro and con. She became an advocate of dress reform. So this was the era where women still wore corsets a lot. <laughs> Too bad to see the, the waist shapener or whatever it's called coming back as a new corset. But in any case, people were discarding the corset to feel freer. And she did regular gymnastics regular weight training, and also played basketball and did crew. So she said, I don't see why if I'm going to be a working woman, I should wear anything that hinders my work. Now, as for social life, she was strongly disposed to avoid men and prioritize her intellectual development. Her mother kept chiding her in letters written to her when she was at college for not answering the letters of a Kentuckian admirer. And she wrote to her mother, I will write to Tom when I have time. Just at present, all my time and attention are given to tariff. <laughs> so, so that was goodbye, Tom. And, uh, <laughs> college offered examples of different kinds. There were many women who put a man first. Wellesley President Catherine Freeman Palmer, who was a really great female educator, resigned her job when she got married to a Harvard professor. But there were also examples of women who chose to remain single. And they, you know, they formed affectionate bonds, some of which were same-sex bonds, some of which bonds of friendship with other women. So she saw all that and really took it in. More challenging to her at Wellesley were the encounters she had with black students. I can't imagine there were very many, because even when I was at Wellesley, and I went there in 1964, there were very, very few black students. But anyway, there were some. And this upset her because she still had these prejudices. She felt uncomfortable in the presence of, of black students, and she said this in letters. But she knew that this was a prejudice, and she had to start rethinking everything about her childhood. And as I say, she later became a staunch advocate of racial equality. After graduation, she decided to tra travel in Europe. And along the way, she rejected a proposal of marriage from a man named Gerald Stanley Lee, whose support of her goal to study law was pretty half-hearted. In his letters, he mentions how important women's work is. And we know what that meant. She went to study law at the University of Michigan, and she was accepted there. But when her mother died in 1892, her father called her back to Kentucky because he needed her <laughs> to help with the younger kids doing women's work and also to help with his legal problems, since he had a lot of them. He had a lot of financial problems, but he especially had big legal problems caused by a lawsuit from a jilted mistress. So he, he was not that admirable a husband. <clears throat> but he, who knows the merits of this lawsuit, but he needed legal help as well, and he knew that she could give it. So it wasn't exactly the right time for her to strike out on her own, but she was determined that all the while she would practice law. In those days, you didn't have to go to law school to practice law. Many, many people did not. And in Kentucky, all you had to do to be admitted to the bar was to take an oath that you had never fought a duel. <laughs> and, well, she, she could take that oath in good conscience. 
So she decided, in order to help her father and in order to do at least some of what she wanted to do, to take up legal practice in her father's chambers. And she also campaigned for his reelection to Congress. She also took a second job to help the family finances, teaching in a private women's school. But because she was depressed and she wasn't doing what she really wanted to do, which was to go to law school and develop her intellect, her health declined. So now we get to the University of Chicago. She was depressed and so she accepted an invitation from a friend to go to the University of Chicago just to visit her. And at that time, she met Marion Talbot, 1858 to 1948. Notice they died in the same year, who was then Dean of Women at the university. She was a faculty member in the Department of Social Science and Anthropology and a pioneer in the scientific study of household labor. She was also a co-founder of the American Association of University Women. She was tenacious, controversial, stridently anti-racist, and she later became Sophie Nisbet's great first great love. She's buried right down the road here in Oakwood Cemetery. I've never actually seen her particular grave, but if you go there and you ask them, now I think by, during COVID they didn't tell you anything and you couldn't uh, really get a map, but I think now they, they would help you. So for the first time, she visited the university where she would spend the rest of her life. Now Talbot spotted her talent and encouraged her to go on to graduate study. She offered her a, a position as her research assistant, and in 1895, Nisba began courses, almost all of them with Ernst Freund, now of whom more in a bit. They were courses in international law, administrative law, Roman law, and jurisprudence. Now, Freund. Freund was the founder and architect of our law school. My last CBI talk was about him, so you, but I think you must all have missed that. He was born in Germany, well, he was born in the US of German parents because they were in New York on vacation. So he was an American citizen by birth, but he grew up and was educated in Germany. He had a German law degree and a US PhD. And he joined the University of Chicago as a faculty member in the Department of Political Science and later was the main architect of our law school. What he did in our law school was to say, unlike Harvard, where people studied simply black letter law and did it by the case method, he thought, because he was a great social critic and a wide thinker about social justice and about different parts of government, that pe lawyers really needed to equip themselves to be active participants in social life and critical and engaged participants. So he uh, actually urged that the law school should begin, not with the usual case method, but in the first year already, there should be not only constitutional law, but also law and philosophy, economics. So law and economics was a big emphasis of his, and he invented the field of administrative law. That was his main contribution, let's say, to legal scholarship. He was at that point at work on his massive tome called The Police Power, which is about a thousand pages long and is a wonderful, wonderful book talking precisely about the problems in the modern nation from these large groups like the police, which intersected with society sometimes in good but often in not so good ways. So Sofonisba was just cut out to study with Freud. He was very interested in women. He wanted to advance women's careers. And later, in fact, he made sure that our law school advanced the careers of women and urged her to have a, a kind of interdisciplinary background. Not only law, but first, she better study political science and especially economics. He thought that was extremely important. So more about her studies in a bit. She got her MA in political science in 1897. However, the family called her back again. They were in financial trouble, and in the spring of 1896, she returned to Kentucky for family financial reasons, and again practiced law while writing her MA thesis. <clears throat> but the practice that she did was just whatever came her way in her father's chambers. There are a few cases that we know about. There was a, one particular case that a battered woman was trying to get custody of her children on divorce, 
And she was very passionate about that case, and she won it. But she concluded that it was really hard to fight for comprehensive reform case by case by case through the legal system. So she was already a little bit skeptical of what she could do as a reformer if she was mainly a lawyer. Now then Talbot, and I, it's uh, unclear at what time their personal relationship started, but Talbot called her back to the University of Chicago for a fellowship in the PhD program in political science that a man had given up. And so she got her, got her real chance right then. And she said at that point, from then on, she never left Chicago without having a return ticket in her pocket. This was her home from now on. So what was the political science department in those days? It was a home of the scientific and quantitative analysis of social problems. And Freund, once again, was a dominant figure. She studied American and European government. She studied constitutional law. She studied the Illinois Constitution. And later, she had a lifelong friendship with Freund, and they worked often together on social legislation. But there were other luminaries she studied with. Harry Pratt Judson, who worked on municipal government, and he taught her field work and applied research. But in keeping with her lifelong love of mathematics, she chose as her PhD supervisor the distinguished mathematical economist Lawrence Laughlin, a rather mainstream neoclassical economist, not a progressive like Freund, but a really fine economist, founder of the Federal Reserve, and they would have differed a lot on politics. <coughs> but Laughlin was famous for recruiting faculty with differing opinions. He recruited Thorstein Veblen, who of course was a leading progressive, and, a famous, and both were famous supporters of women. Laughlin noticed her superb quantitative skills, and so it was a natural partnership. He, she said of him later, he was, uh, this is a wet page, he was a genius in suggesting topics and developing material. He cared, too, for correctness in form and elegance in presentation. So she wrote her dissertation entitled Legal Tender on the History of Paper Money. I don't know whether this dissertation exists. I didn't have time to look that up. But I think it probably does in the stack someplace. So somebody, somebody should look that up. But anyway, so far then, what she found at the University of Chicago was, first of all, a stimulating intellectual community where women were fully included. There were nine women on the faculty in the first year of the university. And there were many women all over the place. The first class of the undergraduate school had fully half women, and that went on to be in a you 50-50 know, ratio. And so she also found a community of people who exchanged ideas across political differences. And this is uh, something that I think we've tried, and it's not always easy, but we've tried to stand for ever since. And her relationship with Lawrence Laughlin, I think, is a good example of things that persist to the present day. In my case, it was actually Richard Posner who first proposed my appointment to this faculty. And we differed on pretty well everything. <coughs> but actually, we taught a course together, Posner and I, and looked at the student evaluations later. And one of the students wrote that what she liked about the class was the wonderful entertainment of watching the professors fight. <laughs> <laughs> So, so that's our history, and I think it's a very honorable history that we should be proud of and that we should struggle to maintain. Okay, so she got her PhD, magna cum laude, but the rest of the world had not advanced as far as Chicago. So she got no job offers. So what should she do? Well, Freud suggested, why not go to law school? The law school had now, you know, she wanted to do it all along, so now she could do it. And she did go to law school as part of the very first class. She graduated, she got her JD in 1904, but so she was, her first year was 1893. She was, so she was a 1L in 93. So she actually finished in two years, and she worked with Freund once again. In her 1L class, there was one other woman, but she was the first graduate because she was able to do it in two years and count prior course credits. Jabour says she graduated with honors at the top of her class, but I haven't found any information to corroborate that. Later, she said she didn't think her work there was distinguished. 
So we don't know. Wikipedia says that she joined Order of the Coif, but in fact, University of Chicago didn't belong to Order of the Coif until 1911, so that's just not possible. Uh, <laughs> so I, I should correct it, I guess. <laughs> in her 1L class, uh, there, there was just one other woman, but she said in some sources, and I think even in Jabour's book, to be the first woman in the US to get a JD. Well, that's correct technically, but not really, really, because in those days, some institutions gave an LLB and some called it JD, but it was essentially the same thing. And later, when that became confusing for some people, they retroactively changed the LLB to JD. My father, who got his law degree in about 1924, I guess, from Mercer, he got an LLB, but way, way later in the 50s, they retroactively changed that to a JD. So she was the first who got something that was then called a JD, but actually the first woman who got a law degree, which was then called an LLB, was Ada Kepley in 1870 from the Union College of Law, which was founded in 1859 by the now defunct Chicago University. And at that time, it was co-run with Northwestern, and it later became the Law School of Northwestern. So she was really the first. Kepley could not enter the bar until 1881 because there was an Illinois law against women practicing law. And that was the law that was challenged in the infamous Myra Bradwell case in 1872. How many people have heard of Myra Bradwell and her case? Okay, I'll, I'll tell you something about that. So uh, first, though, Arabella Mansfield had been admitted to the Iowa bar in 1869, and she was the first in the US. So Bradwell, she was a married woman. She was already practicing law. As, uh, as I said, so many women were, were practicing law without a law degree. But she wanted to be officially a member of the bar. And so she challenged in the courts this law that forbade women to practice law. It went all the way to the Supreme Court, which upheld the law, and a famous concurring opinion by Justice Bradley says this, the natural timidity and proper delicacy which belongs to the female sex evidently unfits it for many of the occupations of civil life. The constitution of the family organization, which is founded in the divine ordinance as well as in the nature of things, indicates the domestic sphere as that which properly belongs to the domain and functions of womanhood. The harmo harmony, not to say identity, of interests and views which belong or should belong to the family institution is repugnant to the idea of a woman adopting a distinct and independent career from that of her husband. So that was that case. Now it's important that we were the last Midwest state to admit women to the bar. By the time of that case, not only Iowa, which was the first, but also Ohio and even Indiana had admitted women. And I think the large explanation for this is the very strong negative conservative influence of the Catholic Church. Illinois has been for all along a predominantly Catholic state, whereas the other Midwestern states are predominantly Protestant, and the Catholic Church campaigned very strongly against women practicing law. But in any case, by the turn of the century, women had been admitted to the bar of most states, but the struggle in legal education continued. Columbia admitted women to law school, in 1929, Harvard, 1950, the University of Notre Dame, 1969. Well, that's a little bit unfair because Notre Dame was a one-sex institution until that time, or even later in the undergraduate school. Yale accidentally admitted a woman in 1885 <laughs> because she applied using only her initials. But they decided, well, we'll allow that woman to complete her degree, but we will now make a, an official rule that prevents other women from doing that in the future. And so they eventually officially admitted women only in 1919, <coughs> still a lot earlier than Harvard, as you see. Now, back to Nisba and her legal career. So she got her law degree, but she was already, as you see, quite dissatisfied with the idea of legal practice. 
She had seen how hard it is to really make change one case at a time. I think she really underrated the importance of legal action on the particular level, but she was really interested in legislation. And Freund was a master of thinking about legislation, and he had taught her to care about that. She also had seen how the law entrenches male privilege, including, of course, her father's privilege in the suit from his mistress. And it was just a tough career for women. She wrote, women have a cruelly hard time in law. So she concluded that the right place to strike out was as an activist. She joined Jane Addams at Hull House in 1907. And well, we'll see in a minute that she pursued a lot of different kinds of activist projects for the rest of her life, always in Chicago. She stayed, though, with the university as her home. She first was assistant dean of women, along with Talbot as the dean of women. And then she <coughs> was a faculty member in the new department of household administration, which was, in other words, applying economic theory to household labor. That has kind of disappeared. It's become unfashionable in a lot of economics. But it was, it's really to their credit that they were pursuing that then. In 1909, she became assistant professor of social economy. She was tenured in 1920. She became a full professor in 1925. She got a name chair in 1929, called the Samuel Deutsch Professor of Public Welfare Administration, and then retired in 1933. As you can see, she lived till 1948. She also held various other administrative posts. She was dean of the College of Arts, Literature, and Science. And then she was highly instrumental in founding SSA, the Social Science Administration, School of Social Administration. That's a thing that we were an innovator in, the whole idea of having a school devoted to the administration of social welfare projects was a Chicago idea. And the whole academic field of social work and social activism as an academic field, that was a Chicago idea. She did this together with the other woman that you see in the pictures, her second great love, Edith Abbott, of whom more later. So a word about her career as an activist and an author. So um, she, first of all, wrote a lot. The fact that at Wellesley she'd been taught to be a fluent and competent writer was really very important. She wrote well, six large books and then a lot, a lot, a lot of articles. The first book in 1912 was one called The Delinquent Child and the Home. And this, it looks like, I mean, I haven't got the actual book, but I've seen a summary of it. Very interesting analysis of crime and poverty, the very subjects we're talking about so much today. She talked about things like food deserts, about the absence of parks and recreation spaces, and the impact of all these things on young children growing up in, a, in an atmosphere of deprivation and the relationship between that and crime. Then in 1912, she wrote a book called The Modern Household with Talbot about how if a, a household was scientifically run along certain scientific principles, that was much better for women. Then, interesting one, in 1921, now Freud was a great advocate for immigrants. He fought hard to defend Sacco and Vanzetti when they were accused falsely of murder. And so he was a great backer of immigrants who were being maligned and treated badly. And she joined him in that and wrote this book about the struggles of new immigrants to form communities and to live well in the United States. And this was called New Homes for Old. Then she wrote one called Marriage and the Civic Rights of Women. Well, you can see that was a huge issue in 1931. And then a really large encyclopedic book, Women in the 20th Century, a Study of Their Political, Social, and Economic Activities in 1933. There were many other active projects, Women's Peace Movement. I think there's a picture of the Women's Peace Delegation up there. She was very involved with Roosevelt, who recognized her talent, and he made her a part of a lot of things in the New Deal. So she and Abbott helped design the Social Security Act of 1935 and helped promote the Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938. 
1933, FDR sent her as U.S. delegate to the Seventh Pan American Conference in Uruguay, making her the first woman to represent the United States at any international conference. So all of these are firsts and, and really very important achievements, and they all rest, I think, on her combination of an interest in law and legislation and her superb skills in quantitative reasoning and uh, connecting that with history and social science. But now I want to turn to her personal life. Now you can see already at Wellesley, she had seen women's difficult choices between a life with a man, which often involved subordination and abandonment of career aspirations, and a life, of course it could be a, a, a solitary life, but often it was a life either in a community of women or in a more intimate partnership with a particular woman. And she chose, of course, the community life was fine, but she also chose intimate partnerships, first with Talbot and then with Abbott. Abbott she met in one of her courses. Abbott was somewhat younger, but they were, she was involved with him pretty much at the same time. So first Talbot and then Abbott, but she remained very close to both of them. And later, it seems that she was more passionate toward Abbott and that Talbot was a little bit jealous. But it's hard to be sure because letters are usually rather reticent. And, you know, what's clear is that all three remained close and remained friends all through her life. In 1928, traveling to Europe with Talbot, she wrote to Abbott, who by then was the dean of the SSA, I don't see how I can go on tomorrow. I can think only of how good you are to me and how I am so foolish and uncertain and disagreeable. I think you understand, dear." And then, of course, she did go on, so there's that. You know, she wasn't actually con proposing to abandon her career for a woman either. A month later, she said, I can hardly bear it any longer. Dear, I love you so. And then to Talbot at another time, she wrote, I shall be loving you and thinking of you and wishing I could know how you are. Now, as I say, Talbot got uneasy. The two seemed to be competing to show which one loved Sophonisba more. But eventually, Talbot seems to have accepted a more distanced place. But it's clear that Sophonisba had enough capacity for love to sustain two intimate relationships throughout her life. What kind of relationships were they? Well, I think it's, uh, with Talbot, I think it's a little uh, ambiguous. With Abbott, the letters are so passionate that I think it's quite clear that they were a couple and that they had some degree of sexual intimacy. Talbot was recognized, Abbott was recognized as her partner, her life partner. When she died, Abbott was regarded as the grieving spouse and, and so forth. And no one objected to that. It was not something they talked about, and I think the price of being accepted was not to talk about it. It wasn't exactly a closet. She didn't try to conceal anything, but she really, I mean, I suppose they walked together everywhere. They were known to be, they were called A and B by people who joked about it. You know, they were always together, Abbott and Breckenridge. And they walked together, these two very diminutive women in their Victorian clothes. And, um, you know, I think it wasn't exactly a closet because she didn't deny anything. But if they had, let's say, kissed erotically in public, that probably would not have been accepted. So there was some repression, but probably much less than if they had been men, I pr propose to you. Because I think it's always been the case that male same-sex relationships have been especially feared and hated by other men. Whereas women, you know, it's an interesting fact that sex between women was never illegal in Britain. They had criminalized sexual relationships, but specified between men. In the United States, the sodomy laws were gender equal, but in fact, in terms of actual hatred and actual prosecution, it's always been directed more toward men. When I was working on this subject in, in terms of writing the book for Jeff Stone's theories about constitutional law and working on this uh, the run up to Colorado's infamous Amendment 2 where I testified as an expert witness for the plaintiffs. I found that the people who were trying to pass Amendment 2, 
talked only about sex between men, and even sometimes talked in such a way that suggested that they didn't even think there was sex between women. So for example, they mentioned a sex, a sexual rights demonstration, and they said, well, there must have been straight people there because we saw a lot of women were there. <laughs> so I think they just found, they just didn't find it conceivable in some way. It, partly because people always define sex in terms of penetration, and there's always this question, how can women actually have sex and so forth. But <laughs> In any case, it's interesting that there was much less prejudice that they faced, and I, I do believe that a, a man in a similar administrative position would have had to be much more reticent. And I've, I've watched this all, all through my career. When I was at Harvard, one of my really great uh, p teachers and a person I greatly admired was Glenn Bowersock, who's still living, who's at the Institute for Advanced Study, great classical scholar who was then chair of the Classics Department. He was a gay man with a par same sex partner who was with him everywhere, Christopher Jones, another great scholar. But when he was dean of the college, of the undergraduate college at Harvard, he was a brilliant administrator and he would have been a brilliant university president. But he knew that he would never become that because of this relationship. So that's when he upped and left and went to the Institute for Advanced Study. The first time that women were deans of law schools and the presidents of colleges. It really was women. Biddy Martin, first at Wisconsin and now, then at Amherst, then uh, Tony Massaro at Arizona Law School. The first man same, in a same-sex relationship who was president of a college was my friend Ralph Hexter at Hampshire College. But that's a, you know, we famously liberal college and um, off the map, so to speak. He later became a provost at the University of California at Davis, but he knew that he wasn't going to go higher. And, and I think, you know, we, we still, it's still a struggle to find a man in a same-sex relationship who's the president of a major university. So I think she was a trailblazer in a way, but it was an easier trail to blaze than had she been a man. But to sum up, because I really want to get to your questions, I think Safanisba was a very important person in the history of the United States social science thought and social science activism, legislation. It's very strange that her name doesn't occur very often. And Jabor was motivated to write her book because she said, I saw, I saw how important she was, but people always misspelled her name and they didn't really know how important she was. And so th this story needed to be told, and it's now been told very well with a lot of new evidence. And she was also intellectually important, and I, I think what she showed was, first of all, what a wonderful home the Uni University of Chicago was for somebody who wanted to strike out and do something bold as a woman at that time. But second, that two of the reasons why it was so good were, first of all, the inclusion of women, but second, the passionate embrace, <coughs> embrace of different opinions. People who work together, like her and Lawrence Laughlin, but who had different opinions. And finally, I guess I'll include a third one, the endorsement of a mixture of quantitative mathematical work with historical humanistic work, history, political science, and well, I, I would say philosophy, but that was not part of her, uh, it was not an arrow in her quiver, so to speak. But anyway, and I, I think the University of Chicago is very much the same as it's been before, and um, it's really something we can be proud of, that we did blaze a trail for women and started other institutions thinking about women's careers in a new way, that women could differ politically and still be appointed to tenured positions, that women could work with people they disagreed with on terms of amity and constructive feedback, and that, again, is something that continues to the present day. So I'm going to stop there and see, see what questions you all have. And do buy the book. It's University of Illinois Press. Yeah. 
Why do you think Chicago was more welcoming of women having academic careers than other universities? Well, I think the, it's partly geographical. The Midwest was much more welcoming in general than the East. And the West just wasn't there yet. But, you know, all the Ivies were really terrible. There's a very good book about the history of women in the Ivies uh, called, uh, what is it? Um, Keep the Damn Women Out is the title of this book. And it records the struggle for co-education even in Princeton, Yale, and Harvard, not in the 1910s, but in the 1960s and 70s. They got to it very late, and there were ferocious struggles, largely because they were run by a kind of WASP elite who didn't even want Jews to be there. They didn't want lower class people to be there. And they really just wanted to keep the privilege the same place. And so there was a reported meeting of the trustees at Yale where the dean of Yale College talked about how they had made progress in including more people of color, and this is 1970 something, and um, more, more people from poor families. And the trustees were upset. And they said, look around. These will not be the leaders of society, they said. Look around this table. Who do you see there? And they said, Lindsay is there, and blah, 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 all these WASP leaders. Now, of course, they, they just didn't even realize that they had made it that way by keeping the other people out. So that's the way they were. And I think uh, Princeton was even more that way. Harvard was tricky because they did have Radcliffe, but Radcliffe was kept permanently in a second class position. So Radcliffe was you know, kept on an admissions quota, even when the classes were mixed. Only one-fourth as many women as men could be admitted. So it was really a very bad atmosphere for women in, in these places. Just, I think it's because of the grip of the WASP elite on, on the shape of those institutions. Actually, as I say, Jews were not included either. So when you think about what Jews were like at Harvard, there were a few, like Oscar Handlin, the great historian, uh, and, but they were treated quite badly. And my, my old friend, former friend, Morton Bloomfield, a great scholar of Renaissance literature, told me that he knew that in his job file, and he, he was, I guess he was pretty much a contemporary of Sophonisba, because he, he was already quite elderly when I knew him, maybe a little, a little younger. But he said in his job file, had been a letter saying, although he is a Jew, he has none of the odious characteristics of his race. So, so that was what things were like there. And Chicago was like a breath of fresh air. The Midwest was always, you know, it had other flaws and other limitations, but it was open to talent, more, more open to talent. And uh, so, you know, in terms of women practicing law, it, uh, both Ohio, Iowa, Indiana were ahead of even of Illinois, and then once we get to Sophonisba's time, it was really striking that nine women were on the first faculty. The first woman on the full-time faculty at Harvard, I, I, I can remember, I mean, it was in my own time, <coughs> because I, I went to graduate school at Harvard in 1969. At that time, there was just one, but she was a very greatly talented woman, a brilliant woman, Adrian Vermeule's mom, by the way, Emily Dickinson Townsend Vermeule, who was a professor of classics and art history. But she was in a chair reserved for a woman and endowed through Radcliffe, so it's not clear whether one should count her. Then there were other eminent women, Judith Sklar was one, who were kept in part-time positions. So I can remember, it was after I was already on the Harvard faculty, that those positions were changed into regular faculty positions. And it's still a big struggle at Harvard. And, you know, I was the first woman to be admitted to the Harvard Society of Fellows, which is a, an organization that was set up to promote scholarship by young men of such and such and such. And they decided that legal cases had established the precedent that men meant members of the human species so that women could apply. But it would took an, an, the initiative of Vasily Leontiev, a great liberal economist, to do that. He was the head senior fellow. He just decided, OK, we're going to admit women. And then he, he went and did that. But, uh, but certainly, Harvard, Yale, and Princeton lagged behind. Cornell was more wide open among the Ivies. I think it was the most wide open. It was co-educational from the beginning. But partly, it was a regional thing. The founders of the University of Chicago really wanted to put ideas first. 
They did not want a school of social prestige, and they didn't care very much about social prestige. So from the very beginning, the place was full of Jews. Of course, Freund is an example. I, I did some research because I have the chair with his name, so I wanted to find out you know, to whom am I being attached. Uh, and, and I wrote, I exchanged letters with his daughter. And the daughter said he was very proudly aware of being a Jew. They, didn't, they weren't observant, but of course he, he was aware of that. And he was probably, I mean, it's hard to know who's the first Jewish faculty member any place, but there was one at Northwestern who compares with him. But you have no idea how long it took for anyone to be admitted to universities. I mean, not admitted, but to the faculty of universities who was a Jew and to the legal profession. Until the mid-1970s, the white, so-called white shoe law firms still excluded Jews, and they certainly excluded women. And so, you know, each group had to make its own way. My father kept telling me, oh, all these women in my firm, they get hired and then they quit because they get married. And he was kind of telling me not to do that. But I think he underrated the role of his firm in <laughs> pushing them out the door. And that's what really did happen to women and to Jews in those days. They got hired and then they just weren't retained. And that was the 1970s. So, you know, it's a long struggle. And it's, it's funny because I think what they thought is our clients don't really like Jews and we have to do what our clients want. And so that's what kept privilege entrenched in that way from particularly from the East Coast, but certainly the Chicago firms were like that too. And so then, you know, we have to do what our clients want, so we'll hire them, but then say, well, socially they didn't fit in. And that's what people were always told, except in certain areas. Bankruptcy was an area where it was not thought the sort of thing for a gentleman. So bankruptcy was okay. Jews could go. And Douglas Baird, you can talk to him about this, because he said that until this day, the bankruptcy bar observes Jewish holidays and Jewish you know, closes early on Friday and so forth. Uh, so, so that was an exception and other litigation was another thing that Jews should do because you don't want to get your hands dirty with too much litigation. But, but yeah, it was the, the WASP idea of the privileged elite. Yeah. Yeah, on, on this point of all these prejudices that existed, can you talk a little bit more about how she overcame some of her own prejudices? And I don't know if she saw parallels and, and struggled with that or, or if she wrote about it much, much at all. Well, all I know, I mean, I haven't done original research, so I only know what's in Jabour and other online sources. Um, she does say that it was a big struggle to get her prejudices against black people changed. And she records how uncomfortable she was meeting with them in classes. And she knew that that was wrong, but she couldn't overcome. Over time, clearly she did, because in the NAACP, she must have associated with, with black women and black men on a basis of equality. But we d I don't have any evidence of exactly what those friendships were like. I mean, did she have intimate social friends who were black? But certainly, I think the important thing was that she knew it was wrong, she tried hard to change, and she put all her efforts into changing the law and changing things in the future. Yeah. So you spoke a little bit about the role of Wellesley in Mark and Bridge's development in her education, and you spoke about it in response to some of the more exclusionary institutions at the time. What do you view as the role of historically women's colleges today? Yeah, that's a tough question, and uh, I went not only to Wellesley. I, I went there for only two years because I left to become a professional actress, which is a long story. But so um, <laughs> I got an undergraduate degree from NYU. But I did go to a women's school in high school. And I love that school. I still return to it. And I think the teachers there are some of the most important influences in my life. I think part of the reason they were so good was that they couldn't go anywhere else but to a woman's private school. So maybe they, the teachers there today are not as good, I just don't know. But my father put two choices before me of two schools, one of which Shipley was more socially attuned and the other of which Baldwin was more academically attuned. And he said, you really should go to Baldwin. But he gave me the choice. And, and that was definitely a good thing and I, I love that school. 
I, you know, today it's hard for me to know. My daughter had a perfectly fine education in a co-ed school, but it was a very kind of Dewey style school. It was not here, the, the lab school, but it was like the lab school. It was called the Cambridge School of Weston. And she, you know, she didn't feel the need for that extra kind of boost. But I think a lot of people still do, and it would be good. I think those places should continue to exist at least for a while. Because until women are really equal, there's always a place for them. I'm afraid that they're, the women who go there are different because it used to be that the most passionate and most kind of aggressive people who wanted to seize life by the throat would go there. But now when I taught at Wellesley for a year, I found people were more passive, more wanting to be spoon fed because they were sent there because they were timid and people thought, well, you'll build your confidence at a women's school. So they really do have a time, hard time getting the right kind of the students that they want. But I still think it's a good idea. As for single sex schools for men, so, so here I was offered a, the commencement speaker job at Wabash College. That's one of two all male schools in the country. Now what should we think of that? Well, <clears throat> I learned, <coughs> First of all, they are not single sex on the faculty. The faculty is very full of women. What they think now, it's sort of like what Wellesley came to think, is that there are men who have learning difficulties, they have a hard time concentrating, they have attention deficit disorder, etc. And this idea of the single sex institution is a way of disciplining these men and making them not spend all their time on frat parties. It's out in Crawfordsville, Indiana, so it's very remote from any place you might go to party. <laughs> so they, they keep talking about the Wabash gentleman. Uh, but I think what they mean is, you know, somebody who really wants their life to get together. And that's okay. You know, I, I see nothing wrong with that, so I did accept that invitation. Um, the all-black colleges, I think th that's the same issue, that so long as there's persistent inequality, these institutions serve a role. I do think sooner or later, you know, women are going to have to learn to get along with men, but it can be, it can be done later. <laughs> you know? I mean, I've, I've been, you know, surrounded by men for most of my career, and I've often been the only woman at round table and the only woman here and there. Now, not so much anymore. And I think, you know, there's a time for the other thing. And of course, at Wellesley, it was quite ridiculous that we would get on buses and be taken to Harvard houses for some drunken party. I hated that part of it. So the thing that you couldn't do was to meet men socially through shared activities. But now I think the single sex schools have solved that problem by having men in classes like Wellesley has cross registration with MIT and others have other kinds of cross-registration. So I, I think their social life is better than mine was. So, so I'm in favor of them. Yeah. yeah. Um, I know in uh, John Blair's The University of Chicago of History, he substantially uses curriculum and region to explain the differences that helped accelerate in Chicago vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Ivies and help get to that point. Do you think that the fact that there was a more inclusive admissions and people actually performing academic work and they were, it's possible that some of these schools like U Chicago and maybe even Stanford were getting greater talent from women that the Ivy's never got and so were able to accelerate up to a further point? Or is that, or would women not have enough social and academic cachet at the time for that to really be a difference? Well, I'll tell you, they knew that it was happening and they knew it was happening. And they also got better men. If you read this book, Keep the Damn Women Out, Nancy, oh, what is her name, who wrote this? Anyway, just look up that title and you'll find it. She says the main reason that the Ivies wanted to go co-ed was they were losing talented men to the University of Chicago and to Stanford, not just the women. So, and then of course the problem that they got later was that when women were let in, they actually did better because they were focused on academics and the men were often let in because they were of social prestige and family connection and they weren't so interested in academics. So anyway, they had that problem, what to do when the men, women were excelling and, and doing better than the men. But yeah, I think it was not just that they got the best women, but ultimately they got men who really wanted to, surprise, surprise, have a relationship of equality with women. 
And of course, <laughs> they wanted to be in a place where you could find intelligent women to date, I'm sure, <laughs> too. But nothing wrong with that, right? <laughs> Oh, okay. I think it is 1.20, so we better stop. But thank you so much for coming.